This week I'm going to talk about um, analysis of PDF documents. So we're going to start um, working through a couple of examples. Um, and, uh, I updated the syllabus earlier over the weekend uh, to kind of compress uh, this topic and also office documents together as two really common examples of ways that um, <clears throat> Your malicious programs are typically, I guess, uh, packaged into uh, document carriers. Um, so if you remember the example attack that we had from week two, we talked about how someone would maybe put together a phishing attack uh, to target you or target whoever else that they're trying to target. Uh, and usually with a lot of these things, they'll try and put the... Uh, put together a document of some sort or you know any type of a uh, attachment that looks like it would be kind of benign um, so many of you would probably you know be suspicious of if somebody uh, emailed you an attachment that was an exe file and uh, you know generally that's pretty you know well established suspicious behavior um, what's uh, more common is that most people uh, don't realize that a lot of the um, things that they consider to be non-executable documents like PDFs um, or Office documents or HTML files or any of those things, um, most users don't conceptually think of these things as um, carriers of executable code even though they are. Um, so I'll talk through PDF uh, with this lecture. Uh, we'll talk through kind of office document structure as well um, in the next lecture and uh, <clears throat> and how to analyze these things. So I won't go into detail of all of the um, attack vectors that there are against PDFs because there's way you could build probably two classes worth of material on just that. Um, but I will talk through kind of some of the concepts, some of the design concepts behind PDF and then also how to use that PDF parser that we discussed back in um, week two. Um, <clears throat> I'll discuss how to use that uh, to better analyze PDF documents you may come across. Uh, and also give you some tips on so how to incorporate that into larger analysis uh, scripts and workflows. So um, as I said, we looked at PDF documents briefly during week two. Uh, that was when we put together that mock attack uh, if you recall, we actually built a malicious PDF out of uh, Metasploit uh, and had it uh, using the Meterpreter reverse shell to connect back to a Metasploit console as a listener. Uh, and the end result was that the uh, attacker who was at the Metasploit console uh, then received a uh, connection that gave them command line access to the Windows machine. So um, one of the big backgrounds to PDFs, and I'll kind of talk through um, kind of what it was intended to be, um, its nexus, and what it's kind of grown into. Um, <clears throat> so it was intended to be kind of a print representation or final copy of a document. So many of you have used like Microsoft Word um, or uh, whatever the equivalent now is in, off, uh, in Apple, um, or if you've used OpenOffice or something like that. Uh, many times you have, uh, when you're working on a document, you have an edit kind of view of the document, you go to print it out. Um, the, pr the version that hits the printer ends up looking uh, quite different a lot of times from the document you were editing. Um, some of the alignment ends up being different, the margins aren't exactly the same as they were, etc. Um, so you basically have a disconnect there between what your document is going to look like, what your document is going to look like, and also what the contents of your document are. Um, PDF was supposed to be right away uh, for you to view on your computer almost identical uh, reproduction of what it should look like or at least the closest approximation you could make for what it should look like on a on a printer and specifically uh, with the PDF standard um, it was based on the earlier developed PostScript language, which was commonly used with a number of laser printers and vector graphics engines. Uh, so PDF did kind of have a more, um, I guess, tailored architecture that was leaning towards what laser printers should show. Uh, so the goal being a 
uh, graphical language that allows you to represent a lot of uh, scalable vector graphics and things like that. Um, specifically, you know, scalable fonts with curves, et cetera, all that type of stuff. Um, we wanted it to also be a way for you to show kind of a final unedited version of a document or uneditable version of a document um, without having that kind of uh, edit view versus print view disconnect that you have uh, with a lot of the common word processors today. So the other goal, of course, is to make a read-only you know, read distribution of a, of a document. So you can print something to a PDF and give it to people. Um, and then for 99% of the user base, they're not going to be able to change the content of that PDF. So you have what amounts to uh, an e, you know, an e printer almost. So it was uh, rooted in the uh, earlier PostScript languages. I said that's uh, another standard that uh, that came through Adobe uh, was earlier than this. So PDFs kind of. Um, uh, 1990s era. I believe PostScript dates back to the 1980s, if not even the 1970s or something like that. Um, they didn't uh, include a lot of the functions that are in the PostScript language because a lot of those ended up being um, uh, functionality that reflected a lot of um, kind of printing hardware limitations at the time that we don't really need to concern ourselves with anymore. So it was also intended to uh, streamline the format a bit more. Um, but because of this, that's why, if you recall, during work two or week two, uh, we were able to interact with it as a uh, as a language as, in, in its own right, as its own like kind of ASCII, you know, human readable language, uh, more or less, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, one thing I will say um, that ends up being uh, the you know progenitor of a lot of exploits is the fact that most PDF readers uh, implement a large number of uh, functionalities that uh, lend themselves to, uh, to exploits and are traditionally uh, exploited for this purpose. So uh, one of these, um, they included JavaScript, uh, or I should say a full JavaScript interpreter. And actually it's a superset of JavaScript, so it's uh, what I call PDFJS, which is basically JavaScript with some very PDF specific extensions and stuff like that. Um, or you might also know the language as ECMA script. Um, there's also a forms UI support. So the ability for you to uh, enter data into a form very similar to how you would do on, a, on the web. Uh, they actually have many different uh, processors and parsers for that uh, as well. So that's how, for instance, if you download tax forms or something like that, um, <clears throat> from the uh, from the internet, uh, you can actually fill out that information, and then it'll produce a uh, principal version of like your tax return or tax filing information or W two that type of stuff. Um, another one that's uh, extremely co uh, common in uh, industrial engineering that type of stuff is um, <clears throat> they have a handful of uh, these are the ones I'm aware of. They might have added more since then of 3D modeling support, so the ability for you to embed uh, a 3D model of a piece, you know, piece of hardware you're making, that type of thing, inside of a PDF uh, using a couple of different languages. Uh, and then the PDF reader, if it supports that functionality like Adobe's PDF reader does and, and a handful of others do, uh, it allows you to actually look at the 3D model and spin it around, that type of stuff, remove layers, things like that, so that you can go and um, you know, inspect it or, you know, you have two entities that are basically sending design documents back and forth. Um, but again, that's you know, a really great example of some more structured um, content that is embedded in there and then an entire interpreting and execution engine built around it that's independent of uh, PDF uh, but is extremely commonly uh, used or exclusively used with PDF. Um, inline HTML is another one. Um, to the extent that, um, you know, if somebody wanted to, uh, they pretty much have all of the functionality within Adobe Acrobat Reader that you have within, say, a web browser that might be three or four years old, at least. So, uh, pretty featureful uh, HTML capability, and then you combine that with the JavaScript functionality and the forms functionality as well, and you have something that can 
um, open itself up to the same realm of exploits as any web browser would. Uh, many uh, embedded uh, image formats, you know, uh, JPEG, JPEG 2000, um, TIFF, uh, a bunch of others, again, uh, that are going to be reader specific, uh, are uh, supported as well. And some of you might be familiar with uh, a handful of exploits related to the TIFF image format or the PNG format or the GIF format. Um, <clears throat> so again, those are just more uh, uh, engines that need to be built into the viewer and then are extra um, uh, avenues for exploitation. Uh, you can embed a PDF within a PDF. So your PDF document can have other PDF documents inside of it. So you have the whole container container um, uh, functionality. This is analogous to if you've ever dragged and dropped an Office document inside of another Office document, which is probably a lot more kind of relatable work stream for many of you. Uh, and then the other one, encoded and encrypted stream data. Uh, so dealing with a lot of these large um, objects like images, etc., you can compress the data. Uh, you can uh, recode the data so that instead of it being 8-bit binary, it's in a different format. Um, you can encrypt the data so they have a way that the data can also be encrypted. Um, and so that, for instance, the user has to enter a uh, password in order to decrypt all the contents. Um, so it has all these features. Uh, one that I totally left out of here and I'll have to make a note to myself to get it on the slide later is also uh, Shockwave Flash, which some of you are probably familiar with as another uh, Adobe product, so Adobe Shockwave. Um, because they made that and it was very popular on the web and you've got all the same functionality in here that was very popular for websites, uh, they decided that they would also port that functionality in here. So every Adobe Acrobat reader also comes with a uh, version of Shockwave Flash Player built into it that can render Shockwave Flash, which itself is a combination uh, scripting language slash programming language uh, that supports uh, something like basically Adobe bytecode language um, and uh, you know image kind of video rendering capabilities, video parsing capabilities, its own compression and a bunch of other stuff like that. So you know in a nutshell uh, it's more than just you know printer friendly representation uh, however uh, I would say that the large majority of the user population for uh, PDF documents generally see them as uh, the thing I preview uh, before I send something to the printer. So when they receive something like an uh, invoice sent to their email or something like that that claims to be a FedEx invoice uh, for a late package that they need to read because uh, if they don't read it then the payment will be overdue and then they'll be slapped with fees or something or at least such is the threat. They receive an email like that, uh, very likely they won't think twice about opening it if it's a PDF because they don't realize that the PDF actually has a lot more of these capabilities you see right here. So, <clears throat> so we'll go into the document structure here for a bit and it's uh, pretty simple. Some of you might recognize this from week two but I did glaze over a whole bunch of this stuff. Um, so uh, to the best of my ability I attempted to put together kind of a table that has, um, that has the entities uh, that are present in the document in the rows and then the uh, contents within those entities uh, are described um, in the columns. So generally speaking, a PDF begins uh, with uh, this uh, kind of uh, sequence of bytes where the ends are actually a uh, Either one of them is any uh, number. Uh, so uh, we may look at PDFs that are you know, 1.4 or 1.7 or 1.9. Uh, generally speaking, uh, those numbers are supposed to reflect, or I should say are supposed to report to the document viewer what version of the PDF specification is being opened, uh, or I should say was used to generate this file. Um, that might cause a viewer to um, disable some feature, you know, elect to disable some features that uh, won't be useful for that particular um, uh, document version. Um, <clears throat> one interesting tidbit that you may run into uh, is that this doesn't have to be at the beginning of the file, it just has to be within the first kilobyte, somewhere within the first kilobyte of the file. 
Um, they support this functionality so that uh, a PDF can actually start with a large uh, block of comments or something like that. So again, um, this is built off of a standard that existed uh, prior to it uh, that would commonly be used for distributing um, commands to a printer to print stuff out. Uh, so back in those days, it might have actually been useful for you to stick about you know, 10 lines of uh, comment code at the beginning of your file uh, that say somebody could look at so they could know, for instance, what type of printer this works well on or possibly even uh, change some settings on a printer. Uh, if they want it to uh, come out looking like it should. Uh, I, don't, I didn't find very many examples of where that functionality came into use. However, uh, it's, a, um, uh, it's a formatting you know, uh, gotcha that a lot of the readers adhere to or you know, support. Uh, and so you'll run into documents where the document doesn't start with this, but it actually starts with just some random data or something like that, and then this is uh, this literal string here is l later on in the file. So following that, uh, sometimes there's some header data that can be interpreted in various ways uh, by different viewers and that type of thing. Um, and then what I generally say is that uh, um, following that is basically, uh, as far as the header is concerned, um, nothing really follows that. It just starts uh, entering into the document. So the next thing is, um, and these three rows right here uh, represent this, is a sequence of objects. Um, so the, each object begins with two numbers, uh, one of which is supposed to be a, uh, I think one is a object number and then the other one is a uh, generation number or something like that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not entirely certain why we have the two numbers, and very frequently when I make PDFs, the second number ends up always being zero. Um, my thought is that uh, there may have been at one point support for there to be uh, older versions. So old, uh, if you have an image within a document and you want to update that image, uh, you could tack on newer revisions of that image without having to go back and delete the old one out of the document. So if you want to edit a partial document, uh, and we'll get into kind of why I think that was kind of the intention back in the day uh, when the uh, standard was first defined. So following that, you'll end up having variable length object data, uh, which is, um, we'll go into the different types of objects that exist, but uh, uh, basically that can be any number of things. When we were looking at the PDF in um, uh, back in week two, uh, we saw that there was actually a stream data, which is part of which is a type of object data, and that stream data would be included in here as well. So this could be extremely big, uh, you know, column, or it could be really really tiny, depending on what data is embedded in there. And then all objects end with this end object. Uh, so I just basically listed another one here, and then you just have like you know as many of those as it takes to build the document. So as many of those as were generated. Um, and then finally, uh, at the end of them, uh, you typically end up having what's called a cross-reference table or XREF table. So um, <clears throat> uh, the XREF table, I have the definition down here, uh, contains an index of all the offsets for each of the indirect objects. So each one of these things is an indirect object, uh, which is just an arbitrary object embedded within the file. Um, so the XREF table contains a row uh, for each one of these things that tells what byte location uh, they begin. So uh, the idea would be that somebody could open up a file and then they could, as you notice, this all ends up being at the end of the file, so it ends up being really close to the end of the file. If my PDF is 100 megabytes large because it has a lot of objects in it, uh, I don't necessarily want my PDF reader to start at the beginning and then scan all the way down to try and figure out where all the objects are. So what it'll do is it'll actually work up from the bottom and it'll read the XREF table and then it'll go around um, those XREFs without directly reading the content within them so that it can build the document structure in memory um, just based on reading you know, the beginning of each object. Uh, and then only, for instance, loading the image data when you scroll to that page within the PDF or something like that. So it supports uh, on-demand loading from disk and on-demand rendering and things like that. 
Um, the goal being that uh, if I'm a user and I want to open a really large PDF, um, the program that's opening it and telling me how many pages it has and stuff like that, uh, that shouldn't be something that takes a really long time. Uh, that should actually happen as close to instantly as possible for me. So this technique where they store that um, cross-reference data at the end of the file, uh, that's supposed to, uh, to help me out with that. And one of the interesting things I have seen is that this XREF table, um, if <clears throat> uh, it doesn't uh, line up with the objects in the document, um, so if the PDF reader uh, finds out that that doesn't exactly work, sometimes it'll go and then just start reading from the beginning of the file to try and reconstruct the document structure itself. So it'll try and um, it, it'll identify something's broken and then it will try and go through and manually read the document to try and reconstruct what it should be despite it being broken. Uh, so another really common um, uh, vulnerability I've seen, if you want to call it that, is uh, cases where a PDF with a broken cross-ref table um, is allowed to be loaded by a PDF reader and then it tries to do that fix up and then it takes advantage of the fact that there's some gaps in the knowledge about the document uh, in the PDF reader itself um, based on that. So those are also things you have to look out for. Um, finally, uh, there's a trailer uh, which is at the bottom here and uh, that contains a pointer to the XREF table. So in addition to having the XREF table itself, which it can be kind of big depending on how many objects are in there, um, you have this trailer that is uh, abutting the EOF marker. And that trailer ends up having a small amount of trailer data, the one of which things is a pointer to the cross-reference table, uh, and then also a uh, dictionary uh, that, defines the, uh, that uh, defines the catalog. So a dictionary that tells uh, the reader what the root object is. So as I mentioned, each one of these objects is uh, considered to be an indirect object, uh, which means that each one of these objects uh, can, and many times do, have a reference within them to other objects in the document. Um, and so that's kind of how the document is built, is that you'll have kind of an outer object, and then that outer object points to other objects that are in there, and then each one of those objects may point to other objects. So like a document, may point to pages, may point to image, and each one of those pages may point to one or more images or paragraphs and so forth. So, and that's kind of how the PDF document's put together. Um, and at each layer of that are instructions on exactly where to locate this in terms of uh, possibly page size ratios or number of inches or number of centimeters or number of, uh, of um, pixels at a certain DPI or something like that. So. <clears throat> so now we'll dive into one of those, you know, one of these objects here and give a bit of analysis as to what it looks like. So as I said, each one of them is, um, is defined using kind of this nomenclature and we'll look at it, but you might have like 10 space zero space OBJ that defines a brand new object or instantiates an object. So you can kind of liken that to, um, you know, creating a new variable in JavaScript using var v equals something or other. In PDF, this is how you create a new object. Um, the uh, object itself um, has a number of data types that it can store. Uh, and again, this definition is kind of what they call an indirect object, which is a, um, an object that has a uh, that's globally addressable, that's addressable within the full document. Uh, within each one of these objects, we can actually have um, what they call direct objects, uh, which are objects that only exist within the context of that object of that object. So almost subobjects. So uh, think about variables that happen within a certain program scope in C or JavaScript or Java or something like that. If you define a uh, number of variables within your main function, um, then if I create a new function in my program, I can't start referencing those variables in the new function. I actually need to pass them as arguments or I need to make copies of them there or so, just something like that. So same kind of same concept here. So at its core, 
the PDF specification defines a number of what I would call its atomic data types or its base data types. So analogous to this, if you recall, we went through that lecture about the C programming language and its base data types. These are the core data types of the PDF language. So Boolean values, so representing true and false. Numbers, so that could be decimal as well as integer numbers. Strings, and strings are typically defined within there using parentheses like this instead of quotes. So for instance, like this is a string including the spaces. So I'd say not to confuse this with like lists in Perl or something like that that are, or in Lisp or something that are defined in a manner, in a syntax similar to this. Names, so what I call character data beginning with a slash. And names are not strings. Names are identifiers almost. So if you create a name, that's an identifier that maybe has a presence or absence of presence, or it's an identifier that references some other data. And you will be able to refer to that named object elsewhere in your PDF code, or that named object, its presence or absence in a document might have some meaning to the reader that's opening it. So when Adobe Acrobat Reader opens a document, if a certain indirect object that's defined like this has a certain direct object underneath it with this particular name, that might actually mean something to the Adobe Acrobat Reader and might cause it to behave in a certain manner or execute certain code that it wouldn't otherwise execute. And so there's kind of another good key point here is that there is another really big executable program whose program flow you're actually controlling with the PDF language. And it isn't just analogous to say C code where I compile it and then I'm controlling the execution of the processor or the CPU with it. In this case, there's actually a completely separate executable program whose code flow is actually directed by the commands, by the arbitrary commands inside of the document. And so that's where things like this come into play, where it is actually looking for a large number of named objects or what it calls names in order to decide how or when or where it's going to run or implement a certain feature. Another example, arrays are ordered data. So it's not just a list of items, but it's actually an ordered list. So there is a kind of first, second, third, fourth, fifth sort of layout to it. And it's addressable as such. So in this case, this is an array that has five items, which each one of them is an independent string value. Dictionaries, which are name index data. And this nomenclature is very similar to Python. If you're familiar with programming in Python, Python has the dictionary type or the dict type. Perl has the hashed array. C++ has the map or the hash map, which basically gives you the ability to, the way they're implemented in PDF, I should say, gives you the ability to create a data object and then give it a PDF name. So the index type is a name and then the value type is whatever you want it to be. It's any one of these. So for instance, this one allows you to create a string that's referenceable using the name val1. And then this one gives you a list with two strings in it that's referenceable using val2. And then streams, which we saw earlier, they're ways of storing large blobs of arbitrary data within a document as well. So if you have a stream, you might provide, there might be a large number of objects that describe how to, how that stream is supposed to be interacted with by the reader. But then the stream itself sits between stream and end stream. 
and has a large amount of data in it. So image data will be stored in there, or JavaScript data will be stored in there, any number of things will be stored in there. So, um, <clears throat> you know, the big thing with this is that a lot of the more advanced features, so the things that I talked about down here, a lot of these things end up being embedded within streams of the PDF document. And for any of the readers that you might use, uh, or I should say for any of the readers that a user might use, uh, the engines that govern um, parsing and uh, reproducing those streams of data on their computer are a ripe target for exploits. Um, and then finally, um, null content's also supported. So um, a basically an empty object is, a, is, totally, uh, is totally okay, uh, is totally acceptable object uh, for PDFs. So. So I'm going to go and um, open up this PDF. Actually, I'll open up this PDF. So dot, dot PDF. So this PDF is actually the PDF that represents the diagram that I showed you. So let me do this. Do we even have? Uh, I don't have a. I don't appear to have a PDF reader on here unless, but I will open it up over here. So, so we'll, we'll just do this. Example one dot PDF. Uh, see what that? Yeah. So there's that malware report we were looking at, right? Uh, so that's right here. Um, I can look at it with this, and I can bring it up here. I can see that uh, this PDF is uh, created so that it's compatible with version 1.5 of the PDF specification. Um, there's also this extra data here. I'm not certain why this is here, but it is here, uh, and it's a... Uh, um, you know, it looks to be some other uh, kind of header data. And so when I was talking earlier, following the PDF, there's frequently a lot of header data, or there can frequently be variable amounts of header data. That's fine. Here's an example of a, so this is a comment. Let me see how my reader on this system. So see, I'm gonna add like a comment in there that goes and explains this you know this report to somebody if they're gonna if they're gonna open the PDF document and look at it like with a editor or a hex editor or something um, but as you can see that text I put in there never shows up in here nor did the reader that I'm looking at it with give me an error to tell me there was some sort of like you know invalid code uh, in the in the PDF so um, but basically, I can look at the different objects that are in here. Um, so you can see this one uh, contains a dictionary right here that goes and describes some information uh, that's meaningful. And then it, following that, it has a stream. And this basically says, um, so you can see this is a dictionary because it is bracketed by these two things. And it's basically a properties dictionary. So it's supposed to tell the PDF reader um, extra information that it's supposed to use in order to um, read this stream. Uh, so it has like a, uh, you know, the length, and I don't exactly remember what all uh, these things mean. Um, but then it tells me that it wants to use a filter on it, and specifically it wants to use the flate decode filter. So then I can go down here, and there's the end of the object after the end stream. And then there's another object, which is object six. Um, <clears throat> and that's right here. And all that does, all object six contains is a integer that says 2371, um, which I don't know exactly what that means off the top of my head. Um, and then there's another object, which is object four. So another key thing that you can see here is that uh, we started with object five, then we have object six, then we have object four, and then we have object three down here. Um, <clears throat> this one ends up having, it says type P 
pages, and then it says kids. So I'm supposing that's supposed. To, I'm concluding that's supposed to be describing some sort of child relate parent child relationship to the data, or I should say to the different pages that are there. Um, this one references catalog. So if you remember, there was like one root object, and that was described as the catalog, which is basically the parent node. Uh, so you can see that's here, and that describes uh, possibly number of pages, um, plus some extra metadata and things like that. Uh, so I do not know what all these little features internal here mean, because there's so many different, um, I, I should say, there's so many different names that are recognizable by the Adobe PDF reader um, that I can't keep all of them in my head. But I could go and look up online and find out documentation about what each of these things mean. Um, there's a way to embed fonts in there, that type of stuff as well. So, um, and so you can go through here um, and look at all this stuff if you want. Um, I'm not going to go through all this stuff though myself, um, other than just to, you know, show you that it exists. I did want to jump down here uh, to to this object. So this is object number two. And uh, you'll notice that object number two ends up having a bunch of these names. So for instance, they have producer uh, creation date, uh, mod date, creator title. Uh, so each one of these things are metadata that will be interpreted by the uh, rendering engine as um, uh, metadata values describing the uh, document. So in this case, uh, this is the program that was used to create it. Uh, there's also an author field as well if I wanted to add it there. So I think I can just do like, well, if I did it here, I'd probably mess up the document structure. But I can put the author in there as well as long as I went through and I changed all of these byte values around. Um, and then each one of these byte values ends up describing, um, <coughs> you know, where various uh, objects start within the document. So for instance, this one might be like one, two, three, four, five. So it says that byte 15 is where, um, uh, is where object five begins. So I might be able to do this to see if that's the case. So I of course screwed up the alignment already, but let me go back and do this remove that comment that I put in there. Uh, so, so byte 15 would start right here. Um, and as you can see, that's where object five zero starts. So, you know, this is also a really good example of, I probably could add an author in here somewhere. So I probably could do like slash author, like Coleman, like that. And then that's going to mess up my offsets um, in the XREF table. But for whatever reason, the reader that I'm using manages to correct for that. So it says, oh, crap, looks like the offsets are screwed up because the document, um, because one of the objects was edited in the middle of the document. But I don't want the document to look like it's broken. So I'm going to go back and start at the beginning of the document and recreate that cross-reference table in memory and just ignore the one that's embedded in the file. Um, so that's a really good example also of another um, characteristic that you want to look out for, which is always be cognizant of what the behavior of the application is. This is going to be opening up a document or opening up a file. Um, the behavior of that may... Um, not exactly adhere to uh, what the file says. It's going to try a lot of times and go through trying to correct things that it thinks are bugs or mistakes or errors within the file. Um, so uh, I wonder if I, yeah, that program doesn't work, but I can do this. PDF 2, and I think I have an example week Oh nine examples week oh nine. There we go, and I'm going to get it into my Remnex VM, uh, and so you can see right here is the file I just put in there. So if I do this, yep, 
uh, this thing actually recognizes properly that the uh, xref table is invalid. So if I go back in here, uh, it can actually pull it out all of this special information that happened to be uh, put in there. So if I wanted to, I could, you know, in order for this tool to work, this is a really good example of a tool <coughs> that fails to behave how I would like it to, which is I would still like it to parse this stuff out if the uh, XREF table is broken. Um, so then that, by broken, I mean, uh, load up that file again. By broken, I mean that uh, these offsets uh, no longer match identically with the offsets that were um, where these things where these uh, object identifiers uh, happen in the file. So, all right. So that's kind of like a quick walk through the PDF object structure. Uh, so. I introduced everyone to this tool like back in week two, which is the PDF parser tool. So it comes uh, built into Remnix, and it can be really ha helpful in navigating the document structure. Um, so uh, one thing that's really helpful is that um, it has the ability to, for you to search for data in an object. So for instance, if I wanted to, I can do, whoops. Uh, I can do PDF parser dash s, and then I can say DVI, um, we'll just say DVI or DVI PS, uh, and um, I think this will work. We'll see if it works or not. And then I'll do ex1.pdf. And so what it did was it searched through and it told me which object that information shows up in. Um, and it basically is doing a string comparison here. So I believe that I can, yeah, and so I can do that as well. I can look for producers. So I can say, show me which object contains the producer. Um, I can say, show me which one contains the word font or which ones contain the word font. And I can look through and I can see that there's an object here that contains it. There's an object here that contains it, et cetera. Uh, the other nice thing, the other nice feature that this tool has for me is it um, spaces these things out for me. So it attempts to parse however the data was organized in, this, in the document. It attempts to parse that into a hierarchical uh, layout for me. So I can try and see what type of object this uh, you know, uh, thing tries to say that it is as well as any of the sub-objects or the direct objects within it. So in this case, um, this one has a, it's a, has a type definition of page, uh, and then it says that it's referencing um, all of these things, uh, which I believe are other um, objects as well. Uh, and then it has information here, like for instance, a media box, which is uh, literally uh, putting some sort of media data within a box uh, so that it can be displayed in a specific spot on the screen. Um, so, but one of the other nice things about this is that if I wanted to, um, I can do this and I can basically have a list of all the objects, all the object names that match that. Um, or I can do this, right? And I can find out which one's the catalog, like that type of thing. Um, so it's very helpful. Uh, one thing I will say is that this operation isn't allowing me to, um, uh, isn't allowing me to search the contents of, uh, of any of the file, or I should say the contents of the stream at all. Um, it's just allowing me to, I don't remember if I can do this or not. Yeah, it's just allowing me to look at the, um, uh, look at the object data, or I should say look at the, uh, the PDF language data that's uh, that's in there. So, so one example. Um, well, I'll get to that in a second. So then, um, I can also search for data in a stream. Um, I can also extract an object 
uh, or I should say, I can extract the stream. Uh, I should say, I can extract an object by number. Um, and then if I really want to, and it has stream data, I can dump the stream data out. So uh, we will go, let me do this. So we'll look at this object number five, whoops, object number five here, right? So I can do PDF parser dash O5 PDF, right? And it's showing me all the object data. Um, if I wanted to, I could also dump the stream data to here. Mm. I don't know why it's uh, getting mad now. Oh. Uh, I might have to do this. Oh, I know why it is, I think. Let me see what happens if I do this again. <laughs> I don't know why it's getting mad at me because I just did this not too long ago. Um, well, let me see. It might also just be getting mad. Could be very well that I'm. Uh, let me just try this. Yep, that one seems. Uh, I'll try this. Okay, so for some reason that's working. Well, we'll just move to that because that's the more interesting one. Uh, as you can see, uh, this tool uh, could possibly use some uh, refinements as well on its own, which is not uh, you know, too uncommon with a lot of these things. Um, uh, but what I basically was running into is for some reason it is getting mad at me for telling it to extract the data that's in this stream for some reason. I have no idea why. Um, Try one more, and then if it still gives me problem, then uh, then I'll just move on to the other example, which actually has. Uh, oh, there we go. I think. Oh, you yeah, just want the PDF. Yeah, there. For some reason, it got the data out of that one. Um, so I don't know why. Uh, for some reason, it doesn't like however object five is formatted. I don't know why. Uh, I don't care to know right now. Um, I got one of them extracted. But as you can see here, uh, this seems to have some sort of data in it. Um, you know, I'll tell you just looking at this, um, this is going to be, this is some sort of font data. Um, for the computer modern font, which was used by LaTeX to generate the text in there. So really good example of um, PDF works uh, really well. Um, and probably a feature that I didn't talk about earlier was that it allows you to embed fonts um, without them being uh, redistributable. And what it'll do is it'll embed the subset of characters that are actually used in the document um, as a font that then the PDF code will render or the PDF reader will render and that allows you to publish a document, a PDF, and then give it to somebody, and even though they don't have the font. Uh, so for instance, uh, this computer modern font isn't gonna be on a Windows machine that someone has that doesn't have LaTeX installed. Um, but it's able to transfer this information and someone will be able to look at the document and see it the same way I did. Um, I'll just look uh, for another stream, uh, you know.
What's that? Yeah. Are you trying to extract only the data from the tree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going through each one of the uh, <clears throat> each one of the objects that seems to have some sort of stream data and then um, and looking at the contents in there. So this one is gonna be another uh, stream data which is like this looks like more font data. So um, and that's basically what I'm pulling out is the uh, uh, is the font data, or I should say, with the arbitrary binary data that's stored in each one of these streams. So, um, uh, so what I ended up doing was um, also grabbing an example PDF, which is right here, if I can type PDF, which is this is a really old uh, PDF document. <clears throat> that actually contains some sort of um, malware in it. And uh, we can actually take a look at this uh, with some of these commands. Um, but, uh, you know, you can go through it like this and, uh, and see all the different streams and all the different objects in it. Um, one of the interesting things here, too, is that, um, let's see, yeah, is that it actually is one of these ones that contains some sort of functionality to have like multiple PDFs embedded within here. Um, so uh, one of the things I found interesting about this particular one is that it doesn't actually seem to have an XREF table even though it says that there is a XREF. So, um, Let's see how Exif tool manages to parse this. It actually manages to pull some of the information out, uh, which means that at the very least, the document structure is one that this thing recognizes. Um, <clears throat> it did take a while, which leads me to believe that it actually had to parse the entire document structure in order to do it. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, um, <clears throat> I can go through here and let me see if I actually put it in here. Um, yeah, so I can list the objects and their hashes here. So this will walk through the uh, PDF document. I'll go back through here and do this, right? So this is the one I was looking at. It has all these different objects. Um, and then that thing underneath this is actually just the comment. Um, and then what it does is it actually calculates a checksum for each one of these. Um, and then this is all the objects, including and excluding the stream data. <coughs> what I will do now is I will look at the, um, I will look at these ones. And so it's got recognizes these things as PDF comments <clears throat> right here, and then even recognizes all the different object tags and the start XREF markers, but um, also, also properly continues to parse the document, even though it doesn't have a cross-reference table. Um, and then it just recognizes each one of these things as comment markers. And so one key thing about PDF is the reason why uh, the percent is used is because that's common um, PostScript and PDF uh, comment. So you can put arbitrary comments in there if you use that. Um, so it kind of has a dual use for the PDF reader. Um, but it tells you what the length of each one of these objects are. And so you can go and look at either one, at any of them. Um, if I wanted to, uh, I, I'll go back here and just kind of walk through some of the features. Um, so <clears throat> you can also get the stats of it, which is here. Um, I believe this gives a summary of all of the, yeah, the summary of all the information in here as well. Um, this is basically built up from the um, trailer and the XREF table and everything. Um, so how it thinks that the um, document's gonna be built and which object associates with each one of these different um, PDF uh, uh, items. 
So which one's the catalog, which one's the X object, which one's the page, etc. cetera. Um, so let me do this. So what I can do is I can, for instance, do this uh, catalog example.pdf, right? And then it shows me that object 9 is the catalog object and uh, tells me you know, what other objects it references, that type of thing. Uh, what I would want to do, though, is I might actually want to go into it a bit more uh, or actually do this. Sorry, uh, does H. I'm going to go back this way and I'll show you why. Because um, I can go through here and I can look at all the objects and I can try and find out which one of these objects is likely to have uh, data I'm interested in. And so I can maybe pick out this one and pick out this one and, you know, I don't know, pick out like, you know, this one as well something, you know, some of the larger objects that are in the document, so 17, 1, and we'll say 2, and uh, what was that, 10, 10. So then I can go to 10, example.pdf, and it contains a stream, I can look at 1, example.pdf contains a stream as well, and then has, oh, this is interesting, has some shockwave flash in it. Um, I can go to like 17, I think was the other one. Uh, that ends up containing a stream as well. It says that's an X object. Um, looks like it's possibly image data or something. Uh, not entirely certain. Uh, and then I think it was like 13 or something like that, which also contains a stream. Um, this contains, it says subtype image. And this one also says subtype image. So those are usually indicative of uh, data that's image data of some sort. Um, so one of the things that I notice is this one is actually some sort of uh, deflated stream data. Oh, that's interesting. So um, this one, um, object 10, appears to actually contain some JavaScript data, as can be uh, understood from looking at this. If you're familiar with JavaScript, um, it's common to describe, um, say, variables or define variables using the VAR keyword. Um, so also, what I might do is I might do this um, to look at object number one in Sharkwave Flash. So this one, I might actually just want to dump out to like obj one dot swift, which is the shockwave flash extension. Um, and uh, what you can see here is it's actually um, shockwave flash. I don't know if I have uh, swift deck swift decompress. There we go. Um, so what I can do is I can actually do obj one dot Swift Let's see if it decompressed it. Uh, load file. Oh, that's helpful. Uh, so there is what I did, and it's not on the slides, but I can, you know, it wasn't intended to be part of the um, lecture, but there's also this Swift decompress, which will um, overwrite a compressed shockwave flash, which is one that begins, shockwave flash begins with that character sequence. So, and then a uncompressed one begins with that. So I can actually look at this. Uh, oops. And there, there's that. So, and so this ends up being a shockwave flash program that then I can go and analyze and uh, hopefully later on in class we'll actually have some time to look at some of these. But uh, for now, I can do this, um, and it goes and tells me information, for instance, what the window size is supposed to be for the flash animation, um, and also um, 
file attributes. So for instance, this flag tells it that this flash animation contains action script. Uh, so in this case, uh, if I really wanted to, I could um, I could have done this, right? Uh, PDF dash H. I could have looked at every single one of the objects, and then I could have. gotten the second argument for each one of them and then you know sort um, sort them by index or whatever and then basically have a loop that runs around each one of these so you write a program that runs in a loop around each one of these to extract each one into a file uh, similar to say um, That and then something like that. I walk through every single one of my objects, try and pull out the ones that have some sort of stream data, and then I have them all in here. And some of them end up being zero length, which means they didn't have any stream data. Some of them have a whole lot of stream data. Um, likewise, I could even do uh, this to use the um, filtering as well uh, to try and see uh, what the you know, what the output of that is um, and so there's a lot less in here so it overwrote some of them uh, I'm going to open up I think it was object 10 yeah and object 10 has that JavaScript in it that we saw and so I could also go and approach analyzing this um, using, you know, just your typical JavaScript analysis. Like one approach uh, might be uh, to just load this up in some sort of JavaScript interpreter, which I, oh, I actually have one in here, um, you know, to run. So, um, or I can go and grab something like this, right? Uh, so this. Um, I'll just uh, kind of give a little bit of a hint of what I can look at here. Um, JavaScript has a function that is called unescape. And unescape has the capability of being able to convert uh, long sequences of hexadecimal data like this uh, into some sort of binary data. Uh, so, uh, Basically, what they're trying to do um, is they have some sort of uh, code that they've decided to embed in here, some binary code. Uh, very likely, it's supposed to be some code that represents um, machine code for execution. So their goal uh, with the PDF document would probably be to exploit that uh, using that Adobe Flash object that we were able to extract. Um, to exploit the Adobe Flash player that's embedded within the Acrobat Reader um, and then get Acrobat Reader to arbitrarily execute this code that it used JavaScript to build somewhere else in memory because JavaScript gives a lot of flexibility to be able to uh, manipulate data completely freely with a language that's uh, very easy to use. Uh, so I can pull this stuff out like this right here. Um, and I don't know, let me see if Rhino works um, to go and do this. So I can do var v equals that stuff. And then var c equals on escape v. And then c has that. So uh, I don't exactly remember how to do the on escape properly. But 
Um, I can do it in Python. Um, Right, I can do that, and then I don't know. Whatever, I'm not gonna go through this. But basically, I can go through and I can put something together like you know, for i and range, you know, uh, zero through length of a. Step two. Um, I guess I can, you know, s equals s plus, you know, um, I can't remember exactly how to do it, but, you know, I, I think I actually have to do the hexadecimal math and all that stuff, but basically, you know, you can put the, eventually you can get to put the character in there um, based on just creating a character by using the um, hexadecimal conversion for each one of these steps, right? Um, so I was hoping that the JavaScript uh, that I was using earlier might have actually been able to do that, but uh, wasn't able to. Yeah. Um, I think I have to. There's probably something else I have to do there too. Anyway, um, I think it's actually I have to insert a. I have to make it look like this, like that, in order for JavaScript to do it. Um, so like. So something like maybe that. I can't remember. Doesn't matter too much. I'll put together some code to go and show you how to pull that. Uh, how to take this data here and turn it into binary data that then you can go and look at later uh, with a hex editor or something like that, um, because that'll probably take more than the amount of class time I have left in order to do. Uh, however, um, I'll go back through a few more of these examples. Um, which is okay, kind of we looked at how you pull out the object, um, listing the objects and their hashes. So that's almost like getting an inventory of all the data that's inside of the PDF. Um, you can search in the stream as well. So you can search in the stream data if you want. And this can be very helpful. For instance, uh, we'll look at the PDF parser right again and we'll say search stream equals and you know, a good. C, uh, sequence of bytes was probably VAR space because we want to look for the stream that has maybe some uh, JavaScript looking text in it. So, oops, helps if I actually use the thing. And then that tells me, for instance, that it was able to find this data within this object. Um, so that's another really helpful tool that, for instance, you want to find if JavaScript exists in there, um, or maybe even look for unescape. Uh, you can find unescape in there as well. Um, or if you want to look for the CWS, uh, we can try and find uh, where does my um, Flash content live. So it wasn't able to find the FWS. And one of the cool things, too, about this is that it doesn't show anything if it doesn't find anything. It makes it very easy to script. Um, so I showed you the filtered object, so that's if it um, ends up having a slash filter tag on it. And so, for instance, I can look here, and I can do the... Uh, right, and I can get a list of all of the objects that have some sort of filter. So grep obj, and that shows me all the objects that employ some sort of filter on their uh, stream as well. Um, I can also 
look, um, I can try and extract malformed data as well. Uh, I can't remember if this one actually has any malformed data or not, um, but I can, uh, I can try and extract it if it does. Um, so what this will do is if there is malformed data within a PDF, which can sometimes be indicative of, um, again, an attempt to make the application behave in a way that the document code doesn't seem to indicate it should behave in. So document violates the spec, but the application wants even a slightly damaged document to be recoverable. Um, so this parser, um, a lot of times if it encounters data that it considers to be malformed or junk data, um, it'll just ignore it. Uh, this is a feature that allows you to actually recover that information too. And if you really want to, uh, you can analyze it. And if you want to analyze it, you can use the dash X to uh, dump it out. So X, I don't remember. So I don't create it. This file doesn't have any malformed data in it. Uh, I can also integrate with Yara. So we kind of messed with Yara earlier. Uh, what this ends up doing is it allows you to, this allows you to do um, a similar uh, feature to this, uh, to these up here. So if you remember, there's the dash s, which allows you to search in objects, and there's the dash dash search stream. Um, I can do PDF parser. And I can go here to Yara, and then it says Yara role to check against streams, and then also print Yara strings, which um, Dash dash your strings. We'll just see what this looks like. Um, I'm not exactly certain uh, what this is doing other than um, yeah. I think that is that uh, if you want it to, uh, if you remember when I was running this uh, right here. This is looking for the, uh, or not this one, but this one. This is looking for the CWS in an object, but when I ran it, it's not actually showing me the match data, it's just showing me the object that matched it. Um, if I was to use just plain Y or just dash dash Yara, that'll allow me to search and tell me the objects that a Yara rule detected uh, information in, but it won't actually show me the content. Um, this allows me to see what the match content was. And so if a lot of you remember, Yara allows you to put this uh, advanced like pattern matching system into it. Um, <clears throat> uh, that allows you to match like arbitrary patterns. And we did an example with a, uh, uh, with a piece of code earlier, um, or with a, a piece of binary code where we looked at the instructions that we were able to get from the program and we were able to make a binary pattern that matched it. If you end up having that, uh, pattern match where you have some sort of wild card or some sort of like arbitrary broad um, it will match multiple things type of pattern it might actually be valuable to you to extract that fragment of the stream that it actually matched on because uh, that might be useful in getting with the output to analyze and then the other nice thing too that I found uh, that it does is um, it allows you to use this MPDF module uh, and whoops uh, and generate, and I'll just show you, a, I think, this one. And um, if you use that dash G option, um, it'll allow you to generate some PDF data, which attempts to reconstruct the PDF document uh, using this mpdf library, which uh, we can go right here and maybe take a look at. Um, This one says it's PHP. Uh, maybe there's one that's a P, that's Python somewhere around here. I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Um, but uh, just do the Python and PDF. So there we go. Diff pi. Uh, I don't know. <sighs> It's around here somewhere. Maybe this one's it. I don't know. Um, but 
basically, yeah, this looks like it. I think you can actually get it from Didier Stevens' um, page because it's listed right here. Um, so it's a module that he's written that allows you to build a PDF out of Python commands. Uh, so this allows you to, um, uh, for analysis, um, this might not necessarily be that great um, by itself, but as you can see, what it's done is it has embedded each one of these individual pieces as separate function calls. Um, so the idea is that you could generate a Python um, analysis script, because a lot of times what you end up doing is writing really quick programs to analyze stuff, uh, and then put it in like this. 